So uh, next up, uh, we have Alexander Kekele, who's uh, director of the Institute for Medical Microbiology at the Martin Luther University of Halle Wittenberg. And he is going to tell us something about uh, the, COVID, uh, um, the, the COVID virus itself and what this pandemic really means. So, um, uh, Alexander, over to you. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me. Um, dear Rector Müller, Rector Engel, Professor Bayer, thank you very much for organizing all this, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for the very kind invitation and the opportunity to share some uh, thoughts about the coronavirus pandemic with you. Um, it has been around two years now that a new virus began infecting humans in the Chinese province of Hubei. As of now, nearly 250 million cases and more than 5 million fatalities have been recorded worldwide. Most likely, the true number of casualties is already in the range of 10 million. Taking into account also the years of life lost and the years lived with disability, the global disease burden of the pandemic sums up to 250 million disability adjusted life years. Disability adjusted life years, the so-called dailies. This means roughly a quarter of a billion years has been lost to the disease, to illness, disability and early death. And coming on top, um, the impact of long COVID, meaning the persistence of symptoms for more than one month, is even not included in these numbers. In addition to the health damages of the virus, there are also enormous economic damages, economic costs caused by the COVID disease itself and also by the countermeasures put in place to fight the pandemic. Present estimates for the global economic damage of, uh, uh, from the pandemic range from 6 to 18 uh, trillion US dollars. 6 to 18 trillion dollars. For comparison, the global GDP of the European Union is around amounts to 15 trillion dollars. And for most uh, regions of this planet, the end of the pandemic is not in sight. Without any doubt, this is the most cat catastrophic uh, global incident that the post-war generations have experienced. In World War II, as we heard, um, um, the deadliest military conflict in history, an estimated 70 to 85 million people perished. But there's also a silver lining here. Compared to the last great pandemic, the Spanish flu, which killed an estimated 50 million, we will have much lesser, lesser casualties now. <clears throat> because and this is especially remarkable um, because the world population was 1.8 billion in 1918 when the Spanish flu hit and is 7.9 uh, 7 billion now. We owe this to the advent of antibiotics in the last century, better health systems across the world and finally, yet importantly, to the COVID vaccines, which were almost literally uh, developed at the speed of light. Pandemics, as we learned from Dr. Silverstein's brilliant pre presentation, thank you very much for this, have been plaguing humanity from the very beginning. Now, thanks to the advances in science and medicine, we are not helpless anymore. For the first time in history, the human species will conquer a pandemic by means of vaccination. In this brief uh, introduction, I would like to highlight four aspects of the pandemic that might be relevant for today's discussions. Number one is the origin of the virus. Number two, its adaptation to humans. The co countermeasures we put in place. And finally, how the pandemic will most likely um, proceed in the future. Let's begin with the beginning. Where did this uh, slimy bugger come from? Is it possible that one of the deadliest outbreaks of all times was ignited by a lab accident? The answer is yes, it is possible. And this holds true even after a group of 27 scientists declared already in February 2020 in the journal The Lancet that the lab leak must be deleted from the list of putative sources of the virus. They wrote by this time, we stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. In other words, even thinking about a lab leak is equivalent to treason. And yes, it was not such a good idea of WHO to elect of all people 
One of the authors of this very stark and prejudiced statement, Peter Dajak from New York, for the commission that was sent to Wuhan to explore the origins of the pandemic. Not surprisingly, the result of the WHO report stated that nobody knows where the virus comes from, but for sure it did not originate in a Chinese lab. And not less surprisingly, people around the world called for another investigation, because this one was obviously biased. Unfortunately, WHO recently perpetuated this mistake by appointing another author of this infamous Lancet statement for the new expert group that shall investigate the origins of the pandemic for a second time now. I think a referee who vehemently and publicly adopted party in this case, condemning any concern about a possible lab leak as conspiracy, will make it easy for critics to again reject the results of the investigation as biased. The inconvenient truth we have to face about the source of the pandemic is we will never find it. Animals for, used for fur production, which I personally believe are the most likely culprit, were culled by the Chinese. And the samples taken from these raccoon dogs, minks and other livestock were never made available to WHO. Actually, Chinese authorities destroyed even the animal and environmental species, the, sa the samples, already in the early weeks of the outbreak. If it was a lab accident, which I personally do not believe in for several reasons, we can take it for granted that the evidence would also have been annihilated with due diligence without any traces left. However, we need China, the world needs China, to prevent this from happening again. And we must cut off all kinds of sources for deadly bugs, may they emerge from nature or from ill-controlled experiments in the lab. Instead of finger pointing here, I suggest therefore that we rather live with the fact that we do not know and we will never know the origin of this outbreak. Ignoramus et ignorabimus. The second issue I would like to touch on is adaptation. After the spillover from the animal kingdom to humans, new viruses are usually not infectious enough to cause an epidemic, let alone a global pandemic. The original Wuhan virus, though, or which we refer to now as type B, was aston astonishingly uh, contagious from the very beginning. This is one reason why virologists believe that the pandemic agent SARS-CoV-2, which most likely emerged from a bat in South China, got a special combat training in an intermediate host. This must have been a mammal with a human-like immune system, such as, for example, a raccoon dog in the fur industry, perhaps. Nevertheless, also this primordial virus was not fit for the job of sparking a full-blown pandemic. We know this from the finding of antibodies in people in Italy and France who had COVID-like diseases as early as in October 2019. This proves that the new coronavirus traveled from China into the world long before the onset of the pandemic and caused small outbreaks in different countries. But these metastases were not contagious enough to maintain local infection chains or in technical terms, which everybody knows now, the reproduction number of these early outbreaks was below one. So how did it happen that this new kid on the block suddenly turned into a full-featured pandemic agent? The answer is, we helped the virus to accomplish this. It was human negligence that allowed the Wuhan type B to become type B1, the much more contagious variant that caused the actual pandemic from February 2020 on. And this did not happen in China or India or some other lesser developed country, but in the middle of Europe in northern Italy. As we presume now, the virus was first introduced in the large Chinese communities in Lombardy and the surrounding areas of northern Italy. As you probably know, the fabric and clothing industry in this area traditionally relied on workforces from China. The outbreak in northern Italy, however, remained undetected for a long time. From a present-day perspective, it was the greatest avoidable mistake 
Um, you could call it the original sin in our combat against the disease. Virologists from Milan, by the way, had the coronavirus PCR up and running and actually started uh, testing patients with influenza-like illnesses already in February. But then the Italian Minister of Health, Roberto Speranza, who is still in office, ordered them to stop the testing because he, as did his uh, many colleagues um, uh, from the EU, believed that the new virus will not spread in Europe. Unbelievable from today's viewpoint. The outbreak was finally recognized by chance because a young doctor from Codogno, a little village in the periphery of Milan, insisted against all odds to test a patient with an unusual pneumonia for SARS-CoV-2, the, the, the pandemic virus. Her name is Annalisa Malara and she is a national hero in Italy now. Tragically, the virus had meanwhile emerged into the variant B1, which was much more contagious than the original Wuhan type. From Italy, B1 spread to the rest of Europe, the US and Brazil, then to Australia, East Asia and finally back to China. By summer 2020, more than 99% of all viruses tested on the globe were type B1 from northern Italy. While China was the source of the virus, northern Italy was the training camp where this bat bug learned how to attack humans. Europe had a good chance to stop or at least significantly delay the pandemic, but it failed. My third topic is the countermeasures, or as we call it, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs. Before the coronavirus stroke, our specialists in all parts of the world had been developing strategies to tackle a pandemic since more than two decades. I myself, I was involved in these projects. The countermeasures were optimized, tested in computer simulations, trained in tabletop exercises and written into pandemic preparedness plans. For some countries, therefore, it was a no-brainer to take out those plans and just execute them. Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, and also Thailand, Uruguay, and of course, New Zealand were very successful with this straightforward approach. World champion is Taiwan, counting only 847, 847 COVID fatalities so far, 847 in a population of 25 million. South Korea, with a population of 52 million, lost still less than 3,000 people to COVID. In Thailand, 70 million population, less than 20,000 people died. In, contra uh, in contrast, Germany, possessing one of the best and most expensive health systems in the world, has suffered over uh, 96,000 deaths now and still counting. How could this tragedy happen? Why did so many lighthouses of democratic values and Western technology fail? Okay, many Americans blame their exorbitant death uh, toll to on Donald Trump. Brazilian judiciary is prosecuting Jair Bol Bolsonaro now and Brits at least have Boris Johnson. But why did Emmanuel Macron, Pedro Sanchez, Giuseppe Conte, Sebastian Kurz from Austria and Angela Merkel falter in the face of this long announced catastrophe? The answer is because they followed no plan. The recipe to fight a pandemic, uh, which is written in the preparedness plans, was just not pulled out. And if, they were, uh, if these recipes were used, it was very often too late. Go hard, go early. You know this phrase, as um, uh, New Zealand's Prime Minister uh, Jacinda Ardern put it, is the mantra of all pandemic control. Go hard, go early. However, Europe did not follow the plan. The first task would have been to appoint a pandemic commission comprising specialists from science and all relevant, uh, re 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 relevant areas of the society. But political leaders were afraid of too much influence from technical committees. Therefore, they rather followed arbitrary gut reasoning and often ended up ill-advised by some single scientists and over-challenged public health authorities. Therefore, Europe started too late testing patients with influenza-like illnesses for COVID. It implemented border controls only when the virus had spread already in the continent. 
It refused to stop soccer games and other mass events. It refused to close schools and to mandate fa uh, face masks. Rapid antigen tests, which were commonplace in Southeast Asia already by March 2020, March 2020, they had these tests there, were introduced in Germany not before October, more than six months later, too late to mitigate the deadly winter wave of 2020. The concept of non-pharmaceutical interventions that was finally implemented and is now followed nationwide comprises five rather simple pillars that go by the acronym SMART, S-M-A-R-T. Number one is shelter and protect the old and other people with a high risk for fatal COVID. Number two is mandate face masks. Number three is prevent airborne infection. Um, number four is ensure rapid contact tracing. And number five um, is test, 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 test for coronavirus whenever people are gathering. It is hard to believe that this SMART concept was proposed already in April 2020. It took almost a year until it was generally accepted and implemented in Germany. If the authorities had acted faster, go hard, go early, we would not only have prevented 10,000s of casualties, we would also have avoided hard lockdowns, repeated school closures and all the secondary collateral damages as I call it, secondary collateral damages that are associated with these measures of last resort. Ladies and gentlemen, let me finally share some short uh, thoughts about the future. With the advent of um, vaccines, the fight against <clears throat> the virus entered a completely new phase. We are now in the end game of the pandemic. And as we know from chess matches, end games will be won if you have a good position and make no mistake. Germany, Austria and many other industrialized countries, after paying unnecessarily high numbers of human lives, diseased people, traumatized children and economic losses, finally achieved such uh, winning positions against the virus. So what will happen next? The enemy will again behave as predicted. It has always behaved as predicted the virus will become somewhat more contagious. But this will not alter the effectiveness of our non-pharmaceutical interventions. The smart strategy will hold the fort also against new variants. Unfortunately, the virus will also proceed to escape immunity from vaccination or from prior infection, as we observe it with the Delta um, variant at the moment. But at the same time, more and more people will acquire some incomplete immunity either by vaccination or the hard way, natural infection and disease. As a consequence, partially immunized um, individuals will be challenged uh, regularly by infections with new variants. This will happen again, again, again and again. Um, this does not lead to the often proclaimed herd immunity. Such a thing like herd immunity actually does not exist. Neither will it bring the pandemic to an end in the near future which has been unfortunately promised by politicians and, very sad to say, also many scientists. However, increasing immunity will gradually bring about a state where SARS-CoV-2, the virus, causes only mild disease in most cases and fatalities become rare. Ladies and gentlemen, this virus will certainly not become our friend. We might, however, consider accepting it as a familiar enemy as some contemporary whom we don't like, but whom we finally got acquainted with. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much for that tour de force. It was quite extraordinary and has clarified so many things. It covered so much. Um, a question came in from uh, somebody labeled HHS which is whether you think that knowledge of the pandemics past and very much current have improved the situation. I mean, given that people fail to react so often and people are not following the plan, are you hopeful that people will follow the plan now? Oh, for the next pandemic, you mean, or for this pandemic? Let's let uh, let, let give you two answers. For this pandemic, 
I became optimistic. At the beginning, some people might know this, I was one of the critics because I was one of these guys who developed the plans and who were really uh, outrageous uh, watching that the world and uh, the Western world did not follow these plans. So for this pandemic, uh, things have changed. Our politicians learned, understood, also scientists came up who really know how to, how to tackle this, this um, pandemic. Uh, for the next pandemic, I'm not this optimistic because, as Sarah Silverstein um, showed us, history repeats itself in a way. And um, we always said uh, after the pandemic of 2003, this was the SARS pandemic, only 8,000 uh, people infected worldwide, like 800 people died by this time. It was called a pandemic. We said, okay, now we have really to be, p prepare. This was only the dress rehearsal. Uh, this was a warning. We have to, the, the vi same virus might come back even. And there were trainings all over the world. I remember trainings in every place, uh, in every industrialized country. Uh, but we were not prepared when this um, virus stroke, even if, if it was uh, really the same thing as SARS. It was really the same virus, just a, just a variant from the virus from 2003. So I'm not optimistic because humans tend to forget trauma. They want to forget trauma and that's also useful in a way for the uh, general people. It's necessary to look forward. Uh, it will be very important to also look forward now in the end game of this pandemic because when we stick to this fear from the virus, we will not be able to release and to go back to our business as usual, even when the virus will, stay, uh, will of course, uh, go on killing some people. So I th I'm not so optimistic about the next pandemic. Um, I have been researching in catastrophes and disaster management for many years. And the, the, the only rule for the next disaster is it will not follow the last plan. It will not follow the last scheme. So if exactly the same thing would happen again, of course, no matter if it came from a lab or from an animal, then we would be prepared for exactly this kind of problem. But if it changes, and um, unfortunately, nature changes its behavior from time to time, and also a lab accidents, if it was an accident, uh, are not always the same. Uh, if it changes, I think we will look very unprepared once again. And looking into the future, because you have a, a political and social and psychological discussion today, um, I think as compared to 20 years ago, we are now in a situation where the world is uh, on a diverging path. We are not collaborating anymore. Um, big countries like China and America are in open opposition to each other for other reasons, not because of the uh, pandemic, not only because of the pandemic, but um, I think uh, in the, on this path which we are on now, it will be very difficult to tackle the next general um, global crisis. May it be a virus or may it be the climate crisis. Thank you very much.